Purnell, and he's the uh, ch uh, chief of the section of interventional cardiology here at Houston Methodist. So Neil, I think, was originally a New Yorker, trained in, uh, at Columbia for his medical schooling before he uh, got the wisdom and moved southward, uh, where he did his residency, uh, internal medicine, uh, and cardiology fellowship at Baylor. And I think Neil has been here since the, uh, let's just say, since he was you know, five years old, uh, since the 1980s. He uh, really is a renowned clinician. I mean, I think we, when you talk to the fellows, we'll tell you, you know, who is it that you want to emulate if you're going to be an interventional cardiologist? And Neil is really one of the top individuals uh, that, that you think of. He is uh, a pioneer both in coronary interventions, an expert on platelet physiology, uh, and also uh, really has, has uh, taken the helm with structural heart disease interventions as well. Uh, it was, it has been involved in over 150 multicenter trials, uh, 280 peer-reviewed manuscripts and, and book chapters. Uh, he's an editorial member of uh, numerous cardiovascular journals. And uh, for uh, anyone that hasn't gone to his Interventional Cardiology Journal Club, you definitely want to make sure you attend that once. I'm not going to tell you what it's about. Tonight. Is it tonight? Well, there you go. So uh, Neil, uh, and also Neil um, likes to keep us guessing. So the only thing he told me was his topic is Interventional Cardiology. So I don't know what he's going to talk about, but welcome, Neil. Well, thanks, Dippin. Um, so, you know, you, you mentioned something really interesting in, in that introduction, which I didn't deserve. And that's going to come up in the talk. And you said, it, Neil's the guy you want to emulate if you want to go into interventional cardiology. So. You know, one perspective is 100% of fellows who want to go into interventional cardiology want to work with Kleiman. Uh, but the other way of looking that, of asking that, and maybe even the more correct way is to say, how many fellows, after having been exposed to Kleiman, want to go into interventional cardiology? <laughs> well, I mean, so that's a good joke, but the truth is uh, it comes up when you interpret clinical trials, which is something I'm going to talk about today. So uh, as Dippin said, uh, first of all, the things Dippin said, uh, I don't deserve. Second of all, if you're sitting in the back row, uh, I understand there are a few empty seats still left at the front. Our chief is taking his customary chair, but one, two, three, four, five, six. So there are more than 10 empty seats in the front row. So if you have trouble reading some of the slides, don't blame me. So Dippin said, I like to keep them guessing, and you know, there's some fun in this. Um, so I'm gonna, I entitled this talk, Interventional Cardiology in Vino Veritas. Who knows what that means? Just raise your hand. Yeah, it means in wine there is truth. I mean, that's you know, an old thing you say before you have too much to drink. And I would bet that uh, probably at least one person here knows why I called it that. Any ideas? OK, well, this is a slide I showed last year. Anyone remember this slide? Al? OK, well, so let, let me point this out uh, if you're not uh, familiar with the details of interventional cardiology. On your left is a wine bottle, and there's an object on the right that is a wine glass that looks like it's been emptied. And in fact, uh, now this is a recognizable photo. This is a table, a dining room table in Andreas Grunzig's house. Wine bottle shown in full, wine glass emptied, uh, shown in the center. Uh, and then a whole bunch of things on the table that eventually uh, were put together to form the first angioplasty balloon. Now, you know, uh, I'm not sure why this photograph is so popular, why it was taken. I'm really not 100% sure why there's a wine bottle in it, uh, except as I think about it, I think about Grunzig sitting at his table, probably relaxing after... Uh, getting about two-thirds through the bottle, and saying, you know, 
I'm having a great time here. I'm relaxing. I'm chilling. And I'm doing what I love. I'm, and I'm creating something that I think is going to be useful. And, and I think you know the story after that. Grunzig, uh, you know, toward the end of his life, uh, which was unfortunately pretty short, uh, was asked what he'd accomplished. And rather than bragging about, uh, you know, creating disruptive changes, and we'll come back to the word disruptive, uh, rather than uh, talking about a whole new kind of treatment he'd uh, developed, uh, really was quite humble. And he said, whatever becomes of the method, knowing that angioplasty may have survived, may not have, I have left one mark on medicine. I have shown that man can work therapeutically within the coronary arteries themselves in the face of an alert, comfortable patient. Now, you know, this isn't completely politically correct. In 2019, instead of man, he should have said people. But I, I think the message is pretty clear. Uh, his take on things was, yeah, you can do things with catheters that uh, don't require a tremendously invasive procedure. Whether angioplasty in the coronary arteries is the catheter procedure or not, at least it was an entree into a uh, different world. And, um, you know, since that time, I mean, how many PCIs are done annually in, in the U.S.? About 500,000, give or take. Varies from year to year. And as we'll get to, we may see some fluctuation in that in years to come. So I wanted to talk a little bit about linguistics here. Um, this is a, uh, a slide I took from uh, Cath Lab Digest. Uh, it's almost 10 years old at this point. Coronary stenting is a model of disruptive technology in cardiovascular care, with more disruption to come. So that, that word, disruption, has become a buzzword in modern interventional cardiology. And I think, first of all, more disruption to come is probably true. We've seen things change. And uh, just uh, two months ago, we saw in the Federal Register, or, or many of its secondary messengers, um, a clear message that CMS is, next year, going to start paying for PCIs done in ambulatory surgical centers. So we've gone from inpatient revascularizations with uh, prolonged hospitalizations to uh, say one day hospital stays to outpatient PCIs and now PCIs in straightforward patients. And I'm certain there will be guidelines indicating which patients uh, have this done appropriately in outpatient settings. So one might view that as being disruptive. It certainly is a change in the way of thinking. And now, uh, that we live in an age of Tavar, this word disruption has, uh, you know, has really become a buzzword. So here's one from uh, two years ago, uh, talking about Tavar. To have played a small role in this disruptive therapy has been one of the, and I don't remember what comes next, but you can use your imagination. Uh, one of the greatest things I've seen, one of the seminal changes during a uh, during my career, something like that. Doesn't take much imagination to paraphrase what's coming next. Um, so, you know, I said, what does disruption mean? Um, and, you know, there are many uh, definitions that can be used for disruption. Certainly, it, there's something abrupt about it. Uh, the, last week, when I uh, searched for disruption on Google, in one half of one second, Google returned more than 300 million hits. So it, it's something we like to, uh, it's a word we like to use now. And I, I, as I'll show you, I think we apply it a little too liberally. So this is the definition of the word disrupt, to break apart, to throw into disorder, or to interrupt the normal course or unity of something. And these are the Oxford English Dictionary definitions. So if I showed you this, 
And I said, we've adopted Tavar. We've adopted a disruptive technology look at the length of stay for aortic valve replacement, down from seven days to three days. Sound okay? Credible? Yes? No? Very credible. Disruptive? Yes? No? Yeah, okay. So uh, I think you guys have hit it well. Well, in fact, this isn't Tavar. Look carefully. Uh, three periods uh, ending in 2014. This is transvaginal hysterectomy in Germany. <laughs> what disruptive things have occurred in that field? Anyone know? Yeah, well, we all read the newspapers. Uh, we all read the New England Journal. Uh, none of us know. You know, clearly the practice has changed. But uh, there's certainly nothing that's been earth-shattering. Nothing's made the ground vibrate in that field that anyone in this room is aware of. OK. And in fact, uh, if you look at uh, aortic valve replacement, uh, clearly there's a very parallel uh, decrease in length of hospital stay. These are taken from uh, work by Vinod Turani, uh, 20 years old now, and from the uh, Partner 3 trial in low-risk patients. So take a look. Uh, 1990, the length of stay for surgical AVR was nearly two weeks. 1997, slightly more than a week. If you look at the low-risk uh, partner trial published earlier this year, length of stay for surgical AVR uh, down to an average of seven days. For TAVR in low-risk patients, down to three days. And as we know, there are patients who get discharged the next morning, possibly even the same day if they've got indwelling pacemakers. Although, by CMS rules, a patient who has TAVR has to be admitted. So, you know, this is the same thing we've seen. And I would say uh, this isn't disruptive. This is evolutionary. Uh, we've thus far replaced one operation, SAVR, with another operation. So big operation has become smaller. Now, is that disruptive, or is this a uh, little bit of self-adulation? Uh, I leave that to you to answer. So again, does replacing a big operation with a smaller one constitute disruption? Yes or no? Uh, well, I would put to you there have been some disruptive things that have occurred in this field. Uh, so if you look at uh, Paul Dudley White, uh, who was a, probably the leading cardiologist of the 40s and 50s. Uh, you know, my mother always used to tell me uh, you know, what a great physician he was. I'm not sure how she knew, but, uh, you know, he took care of Eisenhower, and I think, I guess Eisenhower. Um, th th these are statements from his classic textbook. This is the third edition, 1944, when congestive heart failure appears. Uh, in either aortic stenosis or aortic regurgitation, it indicates a short survival of a few months to a year or two. Two pages later, there is no treatment for aortic valve disease itself. This is 1944. And these are uh, this decade's ACC AHA guidelines. Class 1 indication uh, for AVR, symptomatic patients with severe aortic stenosis. Level of evidence B, this is surgery. So to me, this is disruption. Patients who were dying of a disease for which there is no treatment suddenly have a treatment that looked as though it prolonged survival. And I don't think anyone in this room can argue that it does prolong survival. So. Again, let's go back to the class one indication. Symptomatic patients with severe AS. So if someone is asymptomatic, what do we tell them? Well, in other words, since you don't have symptoms, your disease isn't too bad, we don't need to do anything now. We'll see you again in six to 12 months, depending on your schedule. That's the conversation you have with a patient 
who's got aortic stenosis, but no symptoms. You know, with, with a few exceptions. And you know, the purpose of this talk is not to talk about the exceptions for uh, aortic stenosis, but uh, generally, that's the approach. Anything else is a class two indication. Some A, some B, but no evidence to support it. So let me show you something else that is disruptive. This trial, published this weekend. How many saw it? Okay. This is a change. So this is the first randomized trial of aortic valve replacement with long-term follow-up in patients with severe aortic stenosis, gradient 4.5 meters a second or more, but without symptoms. So you couldn't have angina, you couldn't have a bad ventricle, you couldn't have heart failure, you couldn't have syncope. But you had to have a worrisome echo. Savar versus medical therapy, for follow-up four years from last enrollment, the curves go out to eight years. And if you look, if you're sitting up front and can see, uh, the curves clearly diverge early and keep going in opposite directions. So this is, you know, this is a small study, 145 patients, but this clearly indicates that something's up. And in fact, when one looks at the risk of surgery versus the benefit of surgery, now in the current era, we're talking about a very low surgical risk. So take a look, take a look back here. Uh, zero operative mortalities here. So low risk procedure in low risk patients, a clear benefit. So when you look at this risk of surgery, benefit of surgery, this is the balance. And uh, perhaps I've put these on backwards, but I think you get the picture. So to me, disruption occurs when medical therapy is replaced by surgery, whether it be big surgery or small surgery. The, these are now the expectations. These are low risk results at one year. Uh, I chose the partner three study. I could have chosen the core valve study. Surgery versus TAVAR. And take a look, death or disabling stroke at one year. Not a huge number of patients, but we're still talking about uh, approximately 900. For surgery, 2.9%. For TAVAR, 1%. So I'm not going to take this and tell you, well, TAVAR is much better than surgery for this situation. These results are only one-year results. But clearly, there's an expectation here. And the expectation is that if you're low risk and you don't have a lot of comorbidity, uh, you're going to get through an aortic valve replacement quite well. So you have to put this into the uh, competing risks that you balance when you try to decide if an asymptomatic patient with aortic stenosis should have surgery. And in fact, uh, now that TAVAR is well ensconced, there is currently a trial being led by Philippe Genereau uh, at Columbia looking at early TAVAR. So patients who have no symptoms, excluded if patient is symptomatic, EF less than 50, other surgical indications, bicuspid valve, or high STS risk. So asymptomatic severe AS, uh, TAVAR, randomized to TAVAR versus clinical surveillance. Patients with uh, positive stress tests taken out and placed into a registry. So this is something that's coming down the pike. This is going to be a change in our way of thinking. This is a very different conversation that you have with patients. So you may be sitting here saying, well, we all knew that already, right? Who's thinking that? OK, well, I guess I'm in the minority then, because I was sort of thinking that. But you know, the way you discuss this with a patient, the way you make plans, depends on how much evidence you have and how credible you think the evidence is. And this, I think, is pretty credible. Is it definitive? No. Is it plausible that this is the way things are going to turn out? Yeah, absolutely it is. Here's something else that's, to me, disruptive. This is an email I got. So I've got to go to a meeting in a couple of weeks.
uh, with the American Board of Thoracic Surgery. This is to plan a joint curriculum for a single year of training in structural heart disease for cardiac surgeons and interventional cardiologists. This is a disruptive way of thinking too. Surgeons, um, much as we are friends, colleagues, learn a lot from one another. Uh, we also joke uh, basically that the ways of thinking, the ways of doing things aren't identical. Not all the needles on the dashboard point in the same direction. Well, but it, it's true. I mean, you know, you can be aligned with someone and not think identically to them. That's sort of the way we always worked. Uh, but now we're talking about a single training program, single curriculum, single requirements. Uh, to me, that's disruptive also. That's a big change. Now, how this ultimately turns out, we'll see. I, I don't know. But uh, again, that's, uh, that's why there's a meeting. Okay, so here's something else we all thought we knew. Revascularization in patients with ischemia. Got a lot of imagers here who spent a lot of time for us detecting the presence of ischemia. What do we do with that information? Well, I, I think you guys know what we're getting at here this week. Um, so here are the ACC AHA guidelines for bypass surgery. Bypass uh, cabbage to improve survival is reasonable in patients with significant stenoses and two major coronary arteries with severe or extensive myocardial ischemia, e.g high risk criteria on stress testing, or abnormal intracoronary hemodynamic evaluation, or a more than 20% perfusion defect by myocardial perfusion stress imaging, or target vessels supplying a large area of viable myocardium. Leaves a lot to your judgment, obviously, but uh, this is a class two indication, but it's clearly one uh, that we adopt. Raise your hands if you've adopted this, please. Yeah, raise your hand if you haven't. Yeah, okay, so nobody's flexing their shoulder. Got it. We've all done this. We've all done this all our careers. We all thought we knew this, hands down. And in fact, for PCI, appropriate use criteria have come out and uh, have undergone one revision since their original publication. Take a look. A little stricter, but... Uh, R is rarely appropriate, M is maybe appropriate, A is appropriate. So they've ditched the appropriate, inappropriate uh, categorization. It's may, uh, rarely, maybe, and is appropriate. Take a look. PCI is appropriate for patients with uh, uh, single vessel disease, no proximal LAD or uh, left dominant CERC on more than two antianginal drugs. So if you have angina, you have ischemia, it's now appropriate to do or to recommend PCI in that patient. So this is just the opposite of what we've had for aortic stenosis. So in other words, even if you don't feel bad, your disease is really bad, and you should have an operation, you know, whether it be a catheter operation or open heart operation. Very different than what we've been telling patients with aortic stenosis. Unless, of course, you read the Washington Post. And if you read the Washington Post on Saturday, uh, this is what you saw. And, you know, people called me up. My son called me up and said, congratulations. I said, well, I really didn't do this study. He said, well, congratulations anyway. I said, well, it may put me out of a job. He said, well, maybe not then. Anyway, here was the headline. Stents and bypass surgery are no more effective than drugs for stable heart disease. Highly anticipated trial results show. So, you know, are we looking at a clash of the titans here? Are we looking at uh, Andreas Grunzig on your right versus Jeff Bezos, who owns the Washington Post, on your left? Well, I can tell you that five days after uh, seeing the ischemia results and, of course, reading the Washington Post, I don't know. But let's go through so who are we? What are we doing? Where are we going? Well, that's a useless slide. Forget it. <laughs> okay. I mean, think about it. What talk can you give and not show a slide like that? <laughs> I don't know. So here's the background. Here's the courage trial. 
This, uh, these data are now out 12 years. And this was a trial of PCI in patients with coronary artery disease, not driven by ischemia, not necessarily driven by symptoms. And patients who had been cath uh, were found to have a lean lesion amenable for PCI, and the operator had equipoise about whether it should be done or not. So take a look. 35,000 patients screened, 2,287% consented. That's although the introduction and the discussion at the ACC said this represents 98% of PCIs done in the, in the U.S., take a look. Less than 7% of patients screened fit the criteria. So this is, was a problem with courage. And in fact, this is what uh, I was alluding to when I was joking about Dippin's presentation, about the guy you want to work with if you want to do PCI, if you want to do interventional cardiology. Well, you've got to know, maybe everyone's exposed to me and doesn't want to do interventional cardiology. Well, similarly, if you, you hear you're screening more than 35,000 patients, randomizing less than 7%, and now reaching sweeping conclusions. So you've got to look at the 35,000 foot view as well as the fine details. And as you know, here are the primary outcomes. Uh, no difference in survival. Uh, this was said, well, people do great with medical therapy. Of course, this is 10% mortality. You don't really want to go home from the doc and say, hey, this is great news, 10% chance I'll be dead in six years. Uh, but I mean, the point is in this population that, granted, was uh, pretty uh, rarefied, pretty carefully uh, selected, uh, there wasn't uh, an advantage in hard endpoints for PCI over medical therapy. And uh, Courage faced lots of criticisms. You know, the people who weren't involved with the trial, the interventionalists who weren't involved with the trial said, oh, these were terrible. PCI operators. I mean, you know, none of us like one another's work. That's sort of miserable people we are. Um, here was another criticism. I mean, this was equally nonsensical. Well, they had a uh, very strict medical and lifestyle uh, altering regimen. Well, hell, you know, I would say it. if it works, then you should do it. Uh, but you heard lots about that. Well, we can't do this. Well, it's not that we can't do it, it's we don't want to do it. Uh, prevalent use of bare metal stents. You know, 50% in this trial. Uh, you know, maybe that's an argument, maybe not. It, when we would do a similar trial today, that wouldn't be the case. But I mean, it, you know, these curves don't look like restenosis. They don't look like a couple of months of benefit for PCI, and then the curves converge when the stents renarrow. Uh, I think that's yeah, pretty much nonsense. Highly selective and biased. Well, again, 7% of patients screened and enrolled. I think this is a very valid argument. Patients had an angiogram and uh, were screened after they had the angio. So maybe, you know, maybe, maybe I cathed a patient, maybe all cathed a cath patient said, well, this guy's got a 99% uh, narrowing in his mid-LID. I don't want to randomize this patient. And I'm sure although no one knows, we have, they have not released screening data. I don't think they have. In fact, I know they don't have it. Uh, well, I mean, you know, I bet my bottom dollar this happened. I don't know how frequently that's a problem. If we did know, we'd be better off. Uh, and then we've got FAME2. Showed us something very different. So this is ischemia-based. So to be in FAME2, you had to have stable coronary artery disease, either with symptoms or a positive functional study. All stenoses were studied by FFR, so fractional flow reserve, a very reproducible indicator that correlates very well with nuclear scintigraphy, uh, and has a clear cut point, less than 0.8. Fractional flow reserve, meaning a drop in distal pressure to the perfused myocardium, less than 0.8. I guess that's the ratio. Uh, 
indicates the presence of ischemia. So if you had ischemia by FFR, you were randomized to optimized medical therapy uh, plus FFR-guided PCI, so PCI on the lesions for which FFR was positive, versus optimal medical therapy. And take a look at the uh, KM curves. 1,220 patients enrolled. The study stopped early because of efficacy. Uh, primary endpoint, shown here, reduced significantly by PCI. And then uh, in that final curve down at the bottom, which again, you could see if you weren't sitting in the back or standing in the back, Dr. Kareem, Dr. Mamarian. Um, registry patients, uh, docs seemed to take pretty good care of patients who weren't enrolled in the trial. So uh, composite endpoints significantly reduced in a big way that uh, one year follow-up. And in fact, if you looked at de composite death MI urgent revascularization, out to five years, there's a sustained benefit and a reduction in myocardial infarction. So these are the conclusions of FAME 2. In patients with stable coronary artery disease and functionally significant stenoses, FFR-guided PCI plus the best available medical therapy, as compared with the best available medical therapy alone, decreased the need for urgent revascularization. As, and as you can see, when you follow it out, uh, this translates into a reduction in heart endpoints. So think about that. Reduction in ischemic endpoints becomes a reduction in heart endpoints, death or MI, and a reduction in MI. And here you go. Death, about the same. Myocardial infarction reduced by PCI, urgent revascularization way down. Again, if you're not in the back, you can see these curves pretty well. And of course, we have the Orbita trial published last year. I reviewed this at Grand Rounds last time I gave it. PCI versus conservative therapy of FFR positive lesions. A little more confusing. At six months, there was no reduction in angina. Small trial, only 100 patients in each limb. So things are a little confusing, but it looks as though if you really uh, had enough patients documented pretty clearly that, uh, that there was ischemia in the vessel you were working on, uh, you were looking at, that there was a benefit from PCI, not so clear in orbital. I don't know why this is up here. Okay. So that's part of the background. And then there's this substudy of courage, something that I think was very important, something that uh, has, has been referenced many, many times. And this is, uh, uh, this slide's a little too complex, I think, but the bottom line is this is a predetermined substudy using nuclear scintigraphy within the COURAGE trial. So there are about 300 or so patients in this trial. If you take a look at the top left, it's clear that uh, at one year at least, PCI was more effective than medical therapy alone at reducing ischemia. And so um, patients with uh, a more than 5% reduction in the size of the ischemic defect, 33.3% uh, for PCI, 19% for optimal medical therapy. And if you uh, followed patients out that the other curves show, as you can see in the other curves, um, the more reduction in ischemia you had, so on the top right, reduced 5% versus not reduced 5%, clear survival benefit for patients with more than 5% reduction in ischemic defect size. And if you look at the bottom panels, that's a graded effect. The more reduction you had, the better your survival, or the, rather the smaller your final defect size was, the better your survival. Now, we've known that for a long time. John was probably the first guy to show that, right? Yeah, so uh, the first guy to ever study this in a single center trial is standing in the back. I wish he had sat up front, quite frankly. But, you know, the, I guess, you know, he gets to stand where he wants. So that's background. So think, there's a nice chain of thought here. PCI, 
better than medical therapy alone at reducing ischemia, more reduction in ischemia, better survival. Makes sense. Uh, but can you skip the intermediate mediator here? Does PCI get you better survival? So that's been the big question. Those of us who do this for a living have always, at some portion of our mind, thought yes, even if we never could stand up here and say, yes, PCI improves survival. But, you know, it certainly colored the kind of discussion you had with a patient. You know, patient got stable angina, uh, sent to you for a PCI. What are you going to tell them to expect? I mean, I, you know, I can't in good conscience sit there and say, we're going to put a stent in you, so therefore you're not going to have an MI. You know, the conversation is, well, I think we're going to prevent something bad from happening to you, but I'm pretty sure we can make you feel better. Okay, so with that as background, um, 100 million of your dollars were spent doing this trial. So, Bill, that's almost a full year's salary. <laughs> yes, yours. <laughs> <laughs> So here's the ischemia trial. We've been hearing about this for a long time. We've been involved in discussions of it. We've been waiting for it. So let's take a look at this. I mean, this is whatever you think about the results. This is a very well done, very well designed, very meticulous trial. Stable patients with moderate or severe ischemia. So patients had to have ischemia. The ischemia had to be documented by uh, non-invasive imaging. The non-invasive images had to be submitted and reviewed by a core lab. So if you had this, and the core lab said, yes, this study is being read correctly, there is moderate or severe ischemia, very strict criteria for it, that I don't have time or the understanding, quite frankly, uh, to go into. What happened next? So patient's ischemic. The next step was, well, if this patient has a left main lesion, we don't want to randomize them. We know or think we know what the treatment is for that illness. So if a patient met the ischemia criteria, they then went for a CT angiogram to exclude left main disease and to exclude uh, angiographically minimal disease. So uh, that was performed. Then it turned out about 10% of uh, patients were found to have left main disease here and were excluded from the trial. Now the operators, the, the investigators were blinded to the result. I mean, you were told if a patient had left main or not. You weren't told anything else. So think about it. Unlike courage, and unlike the way Dippin introduced me, uh, patients didn't have an angiogram before they were randomized. So the randomization was to a strategy. It was angiography and angiographically based revascularization or not. So no cath so that, uh, you know, I'd say, hey, we can't treat this patient medically. We have to put a stent in or we have to operate on him. So whether you had a cath or not, assuming you had no left main lesion, was determined by randomization. And these are the endpoints. Primary endpoint, time to death or cardiovascular death, MI, hospitalization for unstable angina, heart failure, or resuscitated arrest. Now, this was expanded a uh, little bit uh, during the course of the trial, and, you know, uh, you know, th these data were presented five days ago. Uh, there are a lot of data accumulated here. We're going to see some of these things coming out. At, at, actually, we're going to see a lot coming out over the next few years as the, these data are, are interrogated uh, more rigidly. Major secondary endpoints, time to cardiovascular death or MI, quality of life. Other endpoints include, you know, all-cause mortality, net clinical benefit, components of the primary endpoint. So here's the thing. Trials being designed, uh, at the time we were uh, involved a little bit with it, and there was some discussion, is death or am I the appropriate endpoint or not? Or, you know, on the other hand, we don't always put stents in 
uh, moderately symptomatic patients for that purpose. Maybe the endpoint ought to be re a prevention of symptoms or reduction in symptoms. And, you know, that was a reasonable discussion, but the argument was, well, you know, look, this is a big trial, high budget. It's going to be reviewed uh, very carefully. Reviewers aren't going to accept uh, a softer symptom-based endpoint. And, and I think that was... Uh, that was a fair argument. I'm not sure that everyone agreed with that, but I, I think the majority of people felt that that was just. Uh, so here are eligibility criteria, uh, inclusion criteria, moderate or severe ischemia. By nuke, more than 10% of the LV. Uh, by stress echo, uh, more than three or more uh, stress-induced uh, segments becoming dysfunctional. Uh, by uh, MRI, perfusion, defect, uh, 12 or more percent of the myocardial infarction, uh, of the myocardium. And uh, during the course of the trial, in order to enhance enrollment, uh, stress testing alone became, uh, became an inclusion criteria if it were high risk. So more than a millimeter and a half of ST depression in two leads, uh, or two or more uh, millimeter depression in a single lead, at uh, relatively low level exertion, less than seven minutes. Major exclusions, the patients you really wouldn't random, want to randomize. So bad ventricle, uh, accelerating angina, unacceptable angina, heart failure, or an ACS. Uh, one very nice thing about this trial is they were pretty rigid in their definition of MI. You can use the uh, you know, the international consensus document for the universal definition of MI. But then if you include periprocedural MI using those criteria, uh, you get a lot of really small infarctions that, you know, that are quite controversial in their, in, in their imports. So they used a modified version, CKMB exceeding five times upper limit of normal. Of course, you know, the SCAI definition uh, that we use is, is a little more rigid than that. Or... Uh, troponin uh, elevation more than 35 times upper limit of normal. This is what you see when you do PCIs. I think these are reasonable definitions. You know, would we as interventionists like to see them a little more rigid? Probably. Can we live with this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, just to show you that uh, these weren't all patients with mild ischemia. Now, one of the things that's ultimately going to come up is the categorization of ischemia as severe isn't bone-crushingly severe. So uh, one of the things that I'm looking forward to seeing is what's the distribution of, of the degree of ischemia here? Is there a graded effect or not when you get up to higher levels? We'll see. Well, these are the outcomes. Uh, if you're an interventionalist, uh, you stopped a minute and took a good look. Uh, actually, these aren't the outcomes. I'm sorry. These are the rates at which revascularization was performed. And I show you this. Just to show you, there's a 28% crossover. So um, not 50%, not 70%, but over five years, slightly more than one-fourth of patients uh, receiving conservative therapy crossed over. And um, just to point out, three-quarters of these were PCIs, one-quarter were CABs, uh, and 98% of the stents in this trial were drug eluting. If you had surgery, 93% uh, of patients got arterial grafts. Here are the outcomes. Primary outcome, uh, cardiovascular death, MI, uh, and hospitalization for unstable angina, heart failure, or arrest. Uh, no difference. Mean follow-up, 3.3 years. Uh, greatest follow-up, five years. Now you can see, although the, uh, there is no difference at the end of follow-up, there is a suggestion that the curves cross. And in fact, this is a little consistent with what was seen way back in the CAST trials, uh, when the separation between medical therapy and bypass surgery only occurred two or three years into it. So, you know, when you do clinical trials, you see something like this that's not your primary endpoint, you have to ask yourself, is this real or is this just wobble in the curves? Is this statistical variation? No curve, no Kaplan-Meier is ever a completely straight line. And when uh, there are subtle differences, sometimes curves go like this, 
and sometimes they intersect several times during the course of follow-up. But you know, nonetheless, it's also plausible that perhaps there's a much later effect to be seen. But so far, it doesn't look that way. Uh, secondary endpoint, cardiovascular death or MI, again, looks pretty similar. What about myocardial infarction? Well, you do pay a price in terms of procedural infarction, but uh, you end up getting a reduction in spontaneous myocardial infarction. Now, that's great. It is a secondary endpoint in a negative trial. It is also a survivor bias. Remember, who doesn't have MIs? Yes, patients who have died. So you have to interpret these carefully, even with the censored analysis. Now, on the other hand, there are some very favorable results here in terms of symptoms. So this is baseline health status. Uh, these are the Seattle Angina questionnaire scores, uh, median of about 74, 75. Quality of life scores, you know, about 60. Uh, frequency of angina, shown here. One-third had no angina. About one-fifth had angina once a day or once a week. So, you know, these aren't terribly symptomatic patients, but, you know, some of them have angina fairly frequently. And uh, so this is a Bayesian analysis of the an angina data. And what you can see is that as a patient is followed for three years here, the uh, patient has, uh, is in the most frequent anginal category. The distribution of reduction in angina is way to the right of this dotted line. The dotted line means no benefit. And obviously, not everyone has the same benefit, but there's a distribution. So these are frequency, uh, frequency distribution of relief or improvement of angina. The farther out to the right you are, the more improvement you have. And if you look at these curves, for patients who have daily to weekly versus monthly versus no angina, as the degree of angina decreases, this curve shifts toward the dotted line, which indicates no difference. As the patient has more angina, it shifts to the right, indicating greater difference. And here's another way of, uh, of representing it. If you look at the probability of no angina by baseline angina frequency, take a look at the blue curve, which is conservative, versus the red curve which is the invasive strategy. So um, what I think this shows clearly is that the, uh, you know, there is a clear graded effect in terms of reduction in angina depending on how frequently the angina occurred uh, at the baseline. So, you know, look. This stuff is five days old. It's a very rich data field, a lot to interpret. When supplemented by uh, CT angiography in patients with stable ischemic heart disease, a routine invasive strategy compared with optical medical therapy alone uh, did not reduce the composite of death, MI, or hospitalization, did appear to reduce the frequency of spontaneous MI, and very clearly reduced the frequency of li and likelihood of angina particularly in those with more angina at baseline. So relief of symptoms, pretty clear. Prevention of catastrophic events. Well, big picture, the most catastrophic events. No. Spontaneous MI, probably. Now take a look. What are we used to in 2019? We're used to this phenomenon of simultaneous publication. Studies presented. Someone is sitting, waiting to push a button. They push the button. The manuscript appears. So take a look. These are the manuscripts that appeared that evening. Reduced leaflet motion after TAVR, controlled trial of rifaroxaban after TAVR, which we are discussing tonight at Journal Club. Uh, early surgery or conservative care for asymptomatic AS. We've mentioned that. Timing of intervention and the editorial. Ischemia is not in here. Now, what does that mean? It means that there's still thought going on, there's still discussion. This is a complex database. We haven't, uh, this is not something that you can present in 15 minutes on a Saturday and then expect even the greatest genius in the world 
to present five days later in Grand Rounds at Methodist Hospital. <laughs> the SCAI, the Society for Cardiovascular Angiography and Interventions, uh, came out with some statements that uh, I think are very accurate here. The ischemia trial findings only underscore the importance of shared medical decision making between physicians and patients. So at this point, I think for us, it, you know, it colors the discussion we're going to have with patients uh, who are sent to us with stable ischemic heart disease. And interestingly, the graded effect on angina turns out the same, uh, at the same meeting uh, jibes with some subsequent analyses of the Orbiter trial, which basically reiterates in a smaller group of patients that there is a graded effect in uh, the likelihood of relief of angina based on the severity of ischemia at baseline. So these things are concordant. So there are a couple of caveats that I think you need to keep in mind. Uh, PCI is a field that's evolving. We're getting better. And one of the reasons we're getting better is because we're getting smarter. So when one talks about PCI, when one talks about surgery, we like to talk about completeness of revascularization. Did you get all the lesions? Did you get all the vessels? That's always uh, kind of a, you know, an unfair discussion because, you know, talk to a cardiovascular surgeon, why didn't you know, this patient had three vessel disease, why do they only get two grafts? Well, the answer is almost always because the third vessel couldn't be bypassed. Well, that just tells you the patient has more disease than the patient who could take three or four bypasses. So that really, regardless of what you do to correct things, that's an unfair discussion. Um, these are data from the Syntax trial uh, back in 2009. Complete revascularization, still more common with bypass than PCI, but still less than two-thirds of patients bypass. So that's a discussion we like to have. I'm not sure it's a meaningful discussion. Well, maybe for this it is, but you know, you revascularize what you can. But there are other things, uh, things that we have learned that we can do, uh, one of which is to do not complete revascularization, but to question the adequacy of revascularization. So this is an important lesson we've learned in stent placement. And this is the ultimate PCI trial presented at TCT last year, published in December. And very simply, they took a group of experienced operators in the current era. We've learned lessons over the last 20 years from IVIS. We know we undersize stents. We know there's a benefit to post-dilating stents. So if that's the principle, the question is, why would you do IVIS? Why wouldn't you just post-dilate everyone, make sure you've got uh, optimal sizing? Well, the truth is, if you look at IVIS findings, even when you think you're doing the right thing, even when you think you're post-dilating a stent, putting in a non-compliant balloon, stretching it so it's a little larger than you originally thought you were going to get. Even when you do that, knowing that you have to be more aggressive than you might have thought a few years ago, uh, even compared with what we find with intravascular ultrasound, you're doing an inadequate job. So in this trial, patients were randomized to uh, either PCI and stenting without IVUS or PCI and stenting with IVUS. So even knowing what we've known from the past without intravascular imaging, there's still a significant difference. And if you take a look at uh, target vessel failure, so that's target vessel MI, stent thrombosis, re-intervention, 4.4% without IVUS, 1.6% with IVUS, probable stent thrombosis, 0.7% without IVUS, 0.1% with IVUS. That's one in a thousand. So we spent a lot of time arguing about intensity and duration of antiplatelet therapy. Take a look at what IVUS alone seems to do. So adequacy of revascularization. I don't know yet how many of these patients had IVUS and had adequate stent implantation. Here's something else we've learned. Fractional flow reserve. Talked a little bit about that before. This is a study by Nicholas von Meegum who's going to be giving grand rounds for us in a few months. 
indicating that if you measure fractional flow reserve after you've put in a stent, uh, you know, there are a substantial proportion of patients who still have impaired fractional flow reserve. A quarter have fractional flow reserve less than 0.85, and 10% have fractional flow reserves less than 0.8, which means they still have evidence of ischemia. And in fact, you can now do uh, a wave-free flow reserve analysis. You can do this online and co-register the uh, findings with your angiographic image. Each dot represents a drop in flow reserve of 0.1. So you can map exactly where that occurs. So another study published at the end of September, which we will be discussing in Journal Club tonight, is the defined PCI study. And in this study, uh, patients underwent stenting using current techniques, current stents, good stent placement. Still fully one-fourth ha still had impaired wave-free flow reserve reductions after a stent was implanted. So one-fourth of patients are still ischemic in that vessel. So clearly, there's something to be said, not, a, not only about completeness of revascularization, but adequacy of revascularization. So what's that going to do to us? Well, I don't know. How are we going to interpret this multitude of data, you know, for which uh, I donated a full year's salary to study? I don't know how this is ultimately going to turn out. We didn't see simultaneous publication. I think that's a good thing here. These data have to be digested carefully. There are lots of things we have to know still. These are uh, frequency of uh, PCI for stable angina. Take a look. STEMI in purple. Steady. Non-STEMI, actually increasing. Unstable angina. Looks kind of flat. Stable angina. Decreased over this period of time. Courage trial published in 2007. Look at the effect that had. Zero. Onset of PCI awareness. Assessments in Washington State. So the predecessor of AUC criteria, somebody's watching. Now look what happens. We get more conservative. So we extend this, take this nationally, and you know, this is going to be done. We're probably talking about one-third of interventions. Follow this out to 2019. Uh, I don't know what we're going to see happen in this curve. I don't know if we're going to see a decrement or not. Now, if AUC criteria change, if guidelines change, if the degree of oversight changes, I think we probably will see some further reduction in PCI for stable engine. But uh, I'm not sure. The other thing is uh, I've talked about Orbita twice. Um, Remember, this is a 100 patient, very meticulously done, a 200 patient, very meticulously done study uh, in the UK. These were all FFR-based uh, PCI. Remember, it, the primary endpoint was no reduction in uh, exercise time, uh, no reduction in angina, although this year we saw there was a graded reduction in angina. Take a look at this. This is from last year. Still, even knowing this, 85% of patients in the non-PCI arm, even knowing these data, said, I'll go ahead and, ahead and have a PCI. So the world, I hate to say this, the world's a very strange place. <laughs> and, um, you know, as my longtime idol, Yogi Berra, said, it's very difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. Thanks. All right, that was, that was phenomenal, Neil, as always. Uh, we're right at 9 o'clock, but we'll, we'll have time for just a couple of quick questions, if there's any from the audience. Uh, while we're doing that, let me ask you a question, Neil. I was a little bit surprised at the reduction in spontaneous MI in the PCI arm. So don't uh, say PCI arm. It's or in the, in the revascularization arm. So, so and, and so let me just postulate one question, because physiologically, that's a bit of a surprise. And the question, is that simply just due to the fact that maybe there's more antiplatelet therapy 
in the revascularization arm? So that's a great question. Uh, I don't know the answer. Um, now, you know, this is the revascularization arm. Remember, PCI or surgery. Perhaps it's all surgery. I mean, perhaps be, by going around the lesions, we're taking care of future plaque rupture. Uh, I don't know what depth duration was. And remember, in a patient with stable angina, you know, the role of antiplatelet therapy is really coming into question now. The duration of required antiplatelet therapy is coming into question as well. So that may well be. Al? Yeah, Neil, great talk. Uh, I'm not sure what the takeaway message is, but one thing that you mentioned with optimal revascularization, uh, despite the studies, countless studies showing that uh, ass assessing FFR pre procedure and then IVIS or whatever post procedure gives you better results. This is still not adopted by the vast majority of interventional cardiologists. So it will never enter into clinical trials where there's large scale uh, patients. But the well, one but message. I'm not sure that's entirely true. It, it's not widely adopted. FFR is used only in about. 10 to 15% of PCIs in the US. Now, you know, if somebody's got a positive stress test in a distribution that fit, and angina, in a distribution that fits, uh, that fits the angiogram, I'm not sure what an FFR adds. Um, but, and, you IVIS, know, but IVIS after stenting uh, is what, 5% of the uh, yeah, I, I haven't seen a recent figure for it, although I'm sure there is one. But the one takeaway message from courage and ischemia is that at least in stable angina, there's no urgency in intervening. And that's a very reasonable message. Uh, the fact that 25 or so percent of the conservatively treated patients still needed interventions shows that that's, you know, conservative therapy is not the final answer in these patients. But you can, you're not obligated to, to intervene when you see a lesion in stable angina. I think that's a reasonable takeaway message. Yes. Well, I mean, it also, I mean, you know, one of the takeaways uh, may be somebody's ischemic. <laughs> you should do a CT angiogram on them. Neil, that was phenomenal. Uh, I really enjoyed it because you looked at it and its complexity in, in different ways. And data is very complex. And uh, I agree with Al that, you know, I think the major conclusion, obviously, is that, you know, you could wait <laughs> and see because these are stable patients to start with. And if they become unstable, whatever it is, or not manageable. I, I just want to, uh, to reflect a bit on what we're trying to do in this complex population, right? So if we have A or more than one stenosis, right? What is uh, of these patients with coronary disease? Uh, we know also that in this population, about two thirds of the MIs occur in the non-stenotic lesion, correct? I mean, that's, that has been, uh, you know, and there is complexity of the medical therapy and Deepen has mentioned maybe a more aggressive antiplatelet therapy in the, in the interventional arm. Also, there is uh, what happens to patients. So the load of the disease, uh, are you, do you have just focal disease or so diffuse in a way that may give you a higher you know, propensity for acute myocardial infarction. This population is, uh, has a lot of ischemia, large ischemia. And it is, you know, good courage for people to go through this, no pun intended. So, uh, and you wonder about their physical activity. I mean, if you have repetitive ischemia, right, and uh, the likelihood of sudden MI or ischemia or repetitive stunning that you could have heart failure, et cetera. So it is so complex in the background. Uh, I want your uh, take on conceivably using the CTA data uh, 
to look at burden of disease in addition to just the stenosis itself, because that may tell us something about the frequency of the MI in the non-stenotic lesions. Okay, so, uh, so this guy, those two guys now have a job. <laughs> burden of disease. I mean, John, you guys worked that out in the scintigraphic world. And I'm sure you have too. Uh, wait, wait, let me finish. Let me finish. Uh, years ago. Uh, but now when we're really talking about atherosclerotic rather than ischemic burden, which, you know, I mean, may, maybe the take home here is we really need to think about atherosclerosis. Uh, when I say globally, I mean throughout the coronary arteries rather than in uh, severely uh, flow limiting lesions. Uh, so you guys now have to come up with an index we can use for the total amount of atherosclerosis. We sort of have gotten at that a little bit in the IVIS world, but you know, not in a really meaningful way. Yeah, so, so let me just comment a little bit about that because you know, ischemia was based on ischemia, right? But not all ischemia is created equal. So you know, we showed many years ago that as ischemic burden goes up, event rates go up exponentially. So 10% ischemia is different than 15%, is different than 30%, is different than 40%. So we already have somewhat of a syntographic uh, uh, feeling for this in terms of where people are at the highest risk and where maybe interventions might be better. From, an, from a CT point of view, I don't think this trial really uh, tells us that we should be doing CTAs on everybody, uh, which was actually one of the comments that came out from Jonathan Leipzig this week that now CTA is going to be you know, used for all of these kind of procedures. Remember that... When you look at people with suspected coronary disease, some 50% have normal coronary arteries by CTA. In fact, the majority of people have, don't even have single, double, or triple. It's only like 15% that have uh, multivessel disease. So to think that CTA is the way to go as an initial test makes no sense at all. And uh, the other thing I'd like to mention is that it would be very interesting to see what actually happens in this trial when they break it down into terms of PCI results versus versus cabbage results. Wait, wait, wait. So you know somebody's going to do that. Yeah. And you know this is, somebody's going to use uh, inverse probability weighting. Someone else is going to propensity adjust them. And um, so I would suggest uh, doing lots of work on your shoulders so you can internally rotate and turn the page when that comes up. Because, you know, these are completely non-randomized. There, there is going to be no way to of course. A, adjust for them. Um, but what will be interesting is reduction in uh, ischemia for one, per, one group versus another because that is yeah. randomized. Well, I, I want to make one comment about medical therapy versus interventions too. You know, in Inspire, which we published 10 years ago, we were able to actually reduce ischemic burden in the majority of patients with medical therapy, but it took incredibly intensive medical therapy. They were on nitrates, beta blockers, and calcium channel antagonists, most of which most people couldn't tolerate at those high doses. And also, uh, you know, we had blood pressure problems and all the rest in terms of maintaining those kind of doses. So everything in life is a give and take. And I think that the whole concept of treating people with medications is a good one. But again, it's about how the patient will respond to that kind of therapy and if they can even tolerate that kind of therapy in terms of our decision making. Well, yeah, but the original thing I posed to you is you guys have a job, <laughs> which you, you dodged the bullet. But uh, I would love for you to come up with a way to tell us how much atherosclerosis is yeah. in the coronary tree. So that's being done with CTA. Uh, we're in the process. I mean, there are computer algorithms that are being uh, put together to look at this in terms of total atherosclerotic burden. And I think it is important, Neil, because CT actually shows plaque better than any other technique in terms of looking at remodeling, you know, calcifications, in terms of non-calcified plaque burden. It's just a matter of being able to quantify it in a very favorable way. And part of the problem with CT is, is been the issues with contrast enhancement and being able to normalize all those kind of values. Yeah. Well, but I think, it's, I think it will be down the line. It's being used in statin trials right now, looking at reduction in low attenuation plaque with serial CT. Yeah, well, I mean, you, you know, you did say there's ischemia, then there's 
severe ischemia, 20% defects, not the same as a 50% defect. Right. So it, it's going to be interesting to see the distribution of defect size, even in the so-called severe group, which is not bone-crushingly yeah. severe, and to see whether there is a graded uh, effect of revascularization or not. I would be very surprised if people had like 30 and 40% ischemic perfusion defects in this trial. Well, we'll see. Yeah. We'll see. Just want to add one thing. There are a lot of software being developed for plaque quantification on CT, but when adopted in multiple trials like Scott Hart and everything, a simple calcium score yeah. beat all of them in multivariate analysis. So your best measure of atherosclerosis uh, for years to come, in my opinion, is still going to be the calcium score. I just want to add one comment about ischemia because if you follow social media, there have been a lot of extrapolations uh, right older. now. And the point here, but a lot of in the room are using it, and we have patients coming in to our clinics already bringing whatever was on the Washington Post and New York Times a few days ago. These patients, as all of us who randomize patients in the trial know, this is a subselect of those with moderate to severe ischemia. We were screening hundreds of patients to find one patient. We excluded patients with low ejection fraction. We excluded patients with recent acute coronary syndrome, PCI within one year, LVEF less than 35%, advanced renal disease. And if you, t if you add the most important excluder in my patients that I included in the trial, where wait, wait, wait. Fifth Amendment, Fifth Amendment. Don't incriminate yourself. <laughs> no, but the, the most important one was symptoms uncontrolled by medical therapy before going in the trial. So you are selecting a group of patients with moderate to severe ischemia who are technically almost asymptomatic or very low likelihood. I mean, how many in our lab and other labs that we see with moderate to severe ischemia who meet that criteria. I can tell you that we looked at it in multiple databases and it's about 10 to 20%. That's why we were screening hundreds of patients to find one patient who would agree to go on that. So let's not extrapolate that to all the patients we see with moderate to severe ischemia in every day and say, oh, this patient moderate to severe ischemia, but he has 20% treat medically. Or this patient with moderate to severe ischemia, but had the PCI six months ago, treat medically. This is not your patient. You need to know the exclusion criteria of the trial to quickly adopt it. And CT was blinded in this trial. So CT, you cannot say, okay, I will start with CT, because once you know CT findings, you're going to increase revascularization, as has been shown in many, many other analyses. So the CT here analogy that has been pushed on social media is kind of, wait a minute, investigators didn't know the results of the CT. Had they known that there was a tight proximal LED or proximal circ or multivessel disease, maybe they would have revascularized the patient or the patient developed symptoms after knowing the CT Well, well but wait a minute. So... I mean, you're sort of turning a blind eye to the uh, purpose of blinding and the purpose of randomization. If a patient had minimal coronary artery disease or if a patient had left main disease, the investigator was told. No, so, no, I, I'm not saying that. I'm saying but, that but, but, the, the, the decision, what is being promoted now, if I see a patient in my clinic with significant symptoms, I'll just do a CT to roll out left main and then treat them medically. No, no, wait, wait. Analysis, if you had significant symptoms, if you had significant symptoms, you don't get onto these slides. Exactly. So this is not ischemia. That model was not tested in ischemia. It could work, but tested in another trial. This is not what ischemia is saying, and we should not overinterpret the results of the trial. All right. Well, I think we're we're past uh, we're past uh, the hour. So thank you, Neil, very much. Okay.